Welcome to the, the Low Carb, Carb Athlete, Athlete Podcast, Podcast, where we focus on discussing topics to help you burn fat, optimize health, and improve performance in life and sports. Transform the whole you from the inside out with the holistic method. Let's dive in. Here's your host, Debbie Potts. Hey, are you an aging athlete? Are you over 40 and struggling to get your desired results? I understand your frustrations. If you're like me, you're trying to get your running back or your cycling back or whatever sport you love to do and you just can't figure out what's missing in your performance gains. How is your training and fueling program working for you? That's what I do. I personalize your nutrition and health program for you based on a bunch of different things. We collect data, collect clues from nutritional therapy assessment, from a food log with symptoms. Look at your genetics. If you've done something as DNA fit, look at blood chemistry panels. Let's look at functional lab tests as a vibrant wellness wheat zoomer to test if you have leaky gut and sensitivity to wheat, peptides and foods. Look at food sensitivity labs and Dutch tests. Look at your hormones. So we look at all these hidden internal sources of chronic stress that may be impacting your ability to burn fat, improve performance and longevity. So if you want to talk about how we can personalize your fueling, training, and performance plan, let me know. Set up a discovery call. Head to my website, debbiepotts.net, and reach out. Set up a call, and we can chat about how I can help you be the best version of yourself. So you can stop blaming the aging process and instead change your mindset that you're embracing the change that we train differently in our 40s and up versus what you did when you're 20, 30-year-old. We need to adjust how we eat, when we eat, why and how, but also match our nutrition with our exercise program and add some more health building lifestyle habits into our day. I call this all the holistic method, comprehensive coaching program, where I work on individualizing clients, nutrition, exercise, stress reduction, sleep, movement, time outside, digestion and gut health, hydration, and my favorite, happiness, play, and laughter. So if you want to know more how you can be your best self, live your best life, and perform your best, head to debbiepotts.net, schedule a discovery call with me, and we can get started on your new health-building journey. You can be that amazing athlete and stop blaming the aging process. Hey, everyone. It's Debbie Potts, and I'm doing a solo podcast today with you. It's been a very long time since I've done this. But I really want to share with you some of the information I'm putting together for training and fueling the endurance athlete, learning how to match your nutrition, your fueling with your exercise, and where does fasting fitting in in all this? And then the female athlete. We're different than the male athlete. So We're going to dive into my PowerPoint slides that I was sharing some of them already with you from KetoCon and then the matching the female athletes. So if you don't know my history, it might make sense for me to share a little bit of it because I have a reason, my purpose, what I'm doing all this for. And if you're watching the YouTube channel, it's the low carb athlete and audio podcast. Obviously you're listening somewhere here. It is the low carb athlete podcast on all the podcast audio versions, but you can also find me on social media. The low carb athlete Instagram is my main hangout. And that goes to my low carb athlete Facebook page. And also if you'd like to join our private group, if you are training for endurance events, you can apply to be in our keto endurance group that Stephanie Holbrook started that I help with as a co co coach, something like that. So let's dive in. I'm going to watch my time. So what's my, why I wrote a book called life is not a race in 2015 sharing what happened to me starting in 2013. Now, I'm finally sharing all this now and it's 2022. What, 
what the heck, <laughs> where have I been? Well, I owned a fitness studio. That was my main stressor in Bellevue, Washington, Seattle area. And I closed it, thankfully, October 1st, 2019, after 10 years of having fun, but also constantly stressed out running my own business. It had a huge rent in downtown Bellevue and the rent went up every January. So I was up to almost $8,000 a month paying rent. And I never really got paid myself. I trained clients. I, we had classes. I created this all-in-one TRX circuit training class in 2010. And then we did 30 minute personal training with groups of three and I had yoga and I had Pilates and I had triathlon coaching and run group. And then we had an infrared sauna and I did nutritional therapy. We had acupuncturist, massage therapist. So we had it all. But guess what? I was doing everything on top of training for Ironmans. <laughs> and fill in the blank when you're doing too much of anything, it is just overfilling your beaker of stress. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But I went from training from Ironmans 2001 until 2013 at a competitive level. I joined Mark Allen's elite training team, 2004. I was doing Maffetone heart zone training. Well, I worked with Sally Edwards in 1995. So long ago with Danskin and helped do coaching for triathlon training for Danskin women athletes and heart zone training. And anyways, fast forward to 2022, we're almost up to 2023. And I I'm sharing my story now because I don't want you to go through what happened to me back in 2013. I went from top of my age group and races and best season ever in 2012, started 2013, January. I remember I did Carlsbad Marathon in February and January, and then February I did Bellingham, a 50K trail run, and my heart rate was high and I was really slow. And Neil, my husband, had to, he finished the race, he had to wait for an hour in the car and it was raining out and cold and like what was going on with me. And then March that year, I was at this mastermind group, Todd Dirk mastermind actually down here in Torrey Pines. And I was doing intervals. I was fasted and doing all the low carb stuff. And, um, I had some alcohol because people told me to loosen up and we had this wine party and whole chapter in my book about it. I was sick for a week. <laughs> so there's something wrong with me. And ever since then I've been destroyed, but I'm much better now because I moved from Seattle, Bellevue, closed my studio, moved here after COVID and hit in June. Uh, and almost two years ago, bought our house and moved in here. End of August, beginning of September, 2020. So two years later, I am happy. And I'm finally sharing my story with you. So I was doing all the right things. As I mentioned, I was doing heart zone training way back when it started Sally Edwards. We did um, her heart zone workout at the Bellevue club. And I helped teach seminars for it eons ago. My first marathon was actually down here where I live now, San Diego and rock and roll marathon. And then I did Ironman starting in 2001. Before that, I was doing long distance cycling events as uh, Seattle to Portland bike ride around, right, ride around Mount Rainier in one day. And I did running relays. So I was getting into the endurance training scene and I had friends that were doing Ironman. I thought, well, I just need to swim a little longer. I did some sprint distance down skin triathlons in Seattle. So I'm like, well, just why not increase my my swimming because I already could do a marathon or I could ride 200 miles. So might as well do an Ironman. So I started Ironman Canada 2001 and I probably still be racing them, but my health took over in 2013 and I haven't been able to race or not actually motivated to do an Ironman again right now. Uh, and then with heart rate training, I was doing math, max aerobic function, maffetone style heart rate. He did, it was just called maffetone heart rate back then, 2000 two, three, maybe eons ago, I was doing that. Mark Allen online is MAO. We did his elite training program. The team I did, but before I was doing his course is how I got into Mark's training program for Ironman. And it was all heart rate based and based on maffetone, low intensity heart rate, and then adding in speed work closer to the race. So I was starting all that. Now I started metabolic efficiency testing equipment, new leaf testing equipment on clients at the Bellevue club way back in 2005, where we measured people's metabolic efficiency. So that was my first introduction to 
actually seeing this mapitone type of low heart rate training and then put that into a uh, treadmill test, oxygen measuring it and actually see it come to life, see how people could burn fat at what heart rates. And I could really personalize a training program based on their heart rate and where they're burning the most fat and prescribe their training program for that and then retest them and hopefully see their metabolic crossover point where they switch from fat to carbohydrates in time and, and make these adjustments. And then started working with their nutrition and knowing what I know now, you know, I wish I could still do testing like that because stress impacts everything. The time of day we did the metabolic testing, testing them on a bike or a treadmill, testing them at rest and then tying in their nutrition. So it'd be so much fun to be able to do those tests now and then, you know, do it eating beforehand and do a fasted workout, see what happens. And then the zone diet that kind of got me into switching to more lower carb the zone was the 40, 30, 30. Barry, Barry, Dr. Sears program. So that was my first introduction to changing what I'm eating and getting off the healthy diet of having a bagel and a banana and a cup of orange juice for breakfast and feeling like crap a half an hour later. So I quickly figured out that did not work for my body. I'm very carb sensitive. And then 2009, I did Bob Sebahor was one of the coaches in the USA triathlon coaching certification course I took in LA and Bob's the only one that was speaking my language. He was saying how we don't need to have all these sugars, these goo gels every hour and have all these calories. Well, as I shared in my book, Life is Not a Race, I was already experimenting with this journey of not eating and going to work out and trying to switch to more fasted exercise and eating more fats. And then I think I got, I don't know what year it was when I got into the Bulletproof coffee came out. I was drinking that. I was doing a fasted workout. So I started all this a long time ago. <laughs> I don't know where exactly I started doing more really low carb when I started doing more fasted exercise. I know I was doing the Bulletproof coffee way too much. I was doing metabolic efficiency training and testing, as I said, over the years on myself and, um, just putting that together with too much of everything is what I'm trying to share. I was doing all the right things, but 2013 hit after this, these pictures on the slide, this is from Ironman Hanu 70.3 in 2012, my husband, Neil and I both did it. And then there's me 70.3 world championship in Vegas that year was so hot. And I did that race. Then a month later, I did Ironman, oh, Canada before that, then 70.3 Worlds. And then I did Ironman Hawaii World Championship. And I always did push ups at the finish line. That's my not the best form of push up, but I attempted to do push ups for how many I did. So my last year there, I did 15 sort of push ups at the finish line. But as I said, lessons learned, I gained 30 pounds that 2013. I did nothing different. I couldn't exercise. I was tired. I was exhausted. I couldn't sleep at night. I'd be that wide awake at two in the morning, not being able to exercise because I was so tired. And then I'd be wired at night when I'm supposed to be sleeping. It was just this constant stress and depression because I couldn't do what I wanted to do. And then even more depression because my body was changing. I wasn't this, I like to be fit and lean and strong. And I was just getting fat and I had nothing to do with what I was eating or what my training was. So I shared all that on some different interviews I've given. So you can find me on other podcasts over the years. I wrote my book, Life is Not a Race, just more therapy session to share what happened to me. And I've written many eBooks. So if you go to debbiepotts.net, you can find a lot of my eBooks. The new one's coming out soon on the female athletes training and fueling for the female hormone cycle. And this one that we're talking about today will be put on the free eBooks on my website. So go to debbiepotts.net and pick up these free eBooks. Don't worry. I don't send out MailChimp emails every week or every month anymore. I just think that they're overwhelming to get so many emails. So I just send you um, email once a few months, once a quarter, maybe I'm not very good at it, but I feel like we're getting so much information. So I'd rather you listen to the podcast, email me questions and follow me on social media. So what is a low carb athlete? Let's go back to this fuel tank. This is more Volk and Finney. Go read their book. They're kind of the 
beginning of this low carb athlete research and Dr. Dan Plews, I just finished his Endure IQ program and doing another course through him, but I will add some information he shares in the program. So let me move my little picture here in the slide. So low carb athlete, that just means we're lower in carbohydrates. Doesn't mean no carbohydrates. I really want to tell everyone low carb athlete means not eating crap. We're eating real food, nutrient dense, nature's foods. So when people go, oh, you're eating zero carbs, low carb. No, it's low carb. That could be for an athlete, 100 to 300 grams a day. Dr. Dan Plews says daily carb intakes vary from 50 grams a day when you're not exercising to moderately low 130 grams. And then before high intensity race that you're actually racing some at a shorter distance, depending on your, what you're doing, but you could tolerate 200 to 300 grams of carbs a day, especially men. So I think we're all different and low carb athlete doesn't mean no carbs. It means real food and get rid of the crap, (laughs) eat your protein. And we'll talk about that. Getting your one gram of protein per ideal body weight is what I look to look at with clients myself and then get healthy fats and then carbs if we need them, when we need them, timing them right. So they're effective. So what does metabolic flexibility mean? We talk about that all the time over the years. And by the way, this podcast, we've had it for 10 years. So if you research on my website, debbiepotts.net, again, you can find podcast archives and you can find Fit Fat Fast was 10 years ago. We have a hundred episodes that we talked only about eating fat to burn fat and being metabolically flexible. Back in the day, they're not, you can tell we just started podcasting, but Vinny Tortorich was on there, Jimmy Moore, I think Dave Asprey. I mean, everyone's too big to have time to podcast anymore, but we were doing this a long time ago. So metabolic flexibility, the ability to use carbohydrates as a fuel only when we truly need them. So backup fuel tank, we are designed to go for long periods of time without food and use fat as fuel, fast feasting. We should be able to depend on fat for fuel, then carbs as we need them for extra fuel tank. That is metabolic flexibility. You're able to switch. Now, I just interviewed Zach Bitter, and we were talking about this, that a lot of people go too extreme on fat, and they lose that ability to switch back to carbohydrates. So I'm a big fan, and I know a lot of people I work with, like Ben Greenfield and other leaders in this space for athletes, it's more cycling, ketogenic cycling. Even Ben Azadi talks about this, and Mindy Pels that we're cycling in and out of ketosis is not ongoing. So if it's like Ben Greenfield talks about eating ketosis, low carb all day and saving your carbs for dinner. So we'll talk about that. So a high carb diet on the left is typical, you know, 60, 50, 60 something percent carbs and the rest fat. And then there's protein somewhere in between. And then a low carb athlete is doing say 10 to 20% carbohydrate for athletes. Remember the guidelines, why I keep sharing what I'm doing on the podcast is the guidelines out there are for people that are not exercising at least once a day as we are and the rest fat. Now this might change these days because I know a lot of people are thinking, oh, where's protein come in? We want to get that protein. So I think these charts are probably going to change a little bit because people need more protein. I think we're eating too much fat, not enough protein, especially for aging athletes. So this chart is on the crossover point. So when we do metabolic testing, if you can go find someone or there's Panoe, which I was going to buy and I put it on hold because everybody I coach is online and not in San Diego. But if you look at this graph on the video, you can see basically what happens when you get tested, why I wish everyone could get tested if if it was easier access and Pinoe's trying to do that. But we have a certain heart rate point and speed that we can track our progress by where we switch from burning primarily fat to burning primarily carbohydrates. So as fuel, I just did a podcast with them and I love those guys and Leighton, the founders, pretty amazing. But I wish they were out a long time ago when I started racing because I was always struggling trying to find the right fuel as a low carb athlete. But remember calories of glycogen storage, say are approximately 2000. And then we have 40,000 of stored calories approximately for fuel stored as fat. 
So ideally endurance sports, when we're going longer as an Ironman or a 50 K trail run or marathon, we want to be very fat adapted and we want to be able to shift that fat oxidation rate from 0.3 grams an hour, for example, to over 1.2 grams of hour, how you train and how you eat. You could go longer as S fuels, they're saying is go longer, have improved stream of energy, preserve your glycogen stores is the main thing you'll hear about. You know, we want to go longer and be able to have that backup fuel tank there when we need it, carbohydrates. This reduces risk of sugar crash bonks and GI stress when we're having too much sugar. So you talk to a lot of us that used to do high carb and why we switched low carb, like I started Ironman's 2001, soon and 2003, I think I kept switching my fuel plan up every year because I would throw up an entire bike ride because I was trying to force myself to drink all these 500 calories every hour. And I'd always have all this stuff just sitting in my belly. And we joke, and I've said this on the show before that we'll feel better if we get the throw up out of us. So TMI, but if you're athlete, you understand what I'm talking about. So OFM, Optimal Fat Metabolism and Vespas by my friend, Peter Defty. We've done tons of podcasts together and he has a great chart. I'd like to share OFM chart of how to be fat adapted, metabolic state, the bottom level, nutrition, not calories, work on your stomach and gut health. So digestion, your microbiome, working on your training and lifestyle. And I call this the holistic method. So somewhat similar to him talking about digestion, gut health, sleep, stress, hydration, happiness, play and laughter is what I talk about. And then Vespa is on here and then strategically putting in those carbohydrates. So not saying that carbs are bad. It's what people are eating is bad. The bad choices we make of the processed foods, refined sugars, refined flours. So Peter talks about on their website, OFM, bio-individuality and one, how one size does not fit all when it becomes to sports nutrition. The best level of ketones probably are subclinical for athletes. Beta oxidation is a pathway for fat burning. Fasting glucose can increase post-exercise. So we want to make sure we're testing and tracking. So I like NutriSense CGM. There's also levels and we want to test maybe ketones sometimes with our blood meter from Keto Mojo. And then I'm actually testing out Biosense right now. It's affordable breath test to check your ketone level from your breath and to see where you are. So we want to improve our fitness level, but we want to improve as a fat adapted athlete when we're training for these long distance events. If you are, as Peter always says, hardcore keto can create adrenal stress and limit performance. So this is what I keep trying to tell people in our keto group. It's not important to be nutritional ketosis of going too low. Those carbohydrates are that backup fuel tank. We still need them as athletes, especially if you are racing and those that have a chronic stress in their lives externally and internally with hidden internal stressors that I find with clients in GI map with their Dutch test with organic acids, food sensitivities, blood chemistry, find those inflammatory markers. They will add to that beaker of stress and impact your performance. So going too low in your carbohydrates, being too strict on keto, sticking with that 50 grams a day, maybe too much for you as a busy athlete. So we need to adjust and listen to your body. Those red flags are important. So fat is your fuel. We want to be intuitive, listen to your body, listen to those red flags. We don't need to eat as many carbohydrates as a typical athlete when we are fat adapted. Doesn't mean zero carbs, but a lot of us don't need any. Some of us do. So our nutrition plan's easier when racing. We don't need to eat as much, but I think some people are going to extreme. We're not this all or none philosophy, right? We don't mean zero. It means strategic carb timing and zero calories. Sometimes people are doing too much fasted exercise when their performance could improve if they add some calories and still keep you in a fat burning state. So the low carb athlete, let me move my video. It's blocking my slides. You don't need to see me. The low carb athlete. So what we're doing is trying to teach you 
how to be oxidized fat at a higher rate. We don't always need to show nutritional ketosis. We want to show metabolic flexibility. That's different for the regular person. Competitive racing and higher intensity workouts are glycogen burning. So I work with my clients at matching their nutrition with their fueling with their training. So if you're doing a high intensity interval training, you can probably afford, or as Dr. Gabrielle Leon says, you can probably, you earn it more with that exercise. So you have increase in those glute transporters that you'll hear people talk about. That means there's more openings to that door to fill up that muscle glycogen. So you can tolerate more good quality nutrient dense carbohydrates that are real food sources. When you do a hit or a high intensity race, or like I did an eight mile race the other weekend, this next weekend, we're doing a half marathon and it's going to be hot and my heart rate will be up and I will be definitely burning a lot more glycogen, but not as much as other people. So the thing is you're burning still a higher percentage of fat, but you'll still burn a lot of more glycogen at those higher heart rates than the, the high carb athletes. So fat is used for aerobic energy. Carbs, glucose is used for fight or flight energy. So when we're stressed, we burn glucose. And when we're racing, running from that lion or racing to that finish line or to the top of that hill or to pass someone, we will shift to that carbohydrate glucose fuel tank. So that strategic carb fueling is that backup tank, the rocket fuel that we have. Now we want to be fat adapted first and then start playing around with these carb timing. Again, that doesn't mean having bagels and cliff bars and all this stuff might just mean something with 20 grams of carbs. So the eight elements I was talking about of the holistic method is a program I created 10 years ago, trying to get athletes fit and healthy from the inside out, because I knew from training clients for 20, well, more than 25 years, I've been a personal trainer since college and now somehow I'm 50, uh, this program I created over the years. So nutrition, exercise, sleep, stress management, movement and mobility, digestion and gut health, hydration, happiness, play, gratitude, laughter is the eighth one. Now they're all important, but I must say, if you don't get your sleep, all this is impacted, right? If I don't get a good night's sleep, my digestion, gut health, my hydration, my stress, my sleep, all this is impacted. If I am stressed out, all of this is impacted. So I do work with people first, become fat adapted, nail their nutrition, but it's next step. And it's just as important, but I, I try not to overwhelm people doing all this at once that you have to prioritize your sleep. You have to learn how to manage your stress. I have people do yoga and meditation type of yoga or yin yoga and breathing exercises, taking a hot, cold shower, you know, doing different things to wake up in the morning and having a bath, that's a salt bath or something at nighttime using your biomat or Normatag and things like that help you get more in that parasympathetic state. So all these elements are really essential to work on when I am coaching my clients of all fitness levels to improve performance, improve fat loss, performance, and longevity. Now, nutrition is important. Obviously, I just said I'll start people in a three-phase program, kind of a jumpstart five-day, 21-day detox and digestive reset, and then transition to maintenance where we do kind of cyclical keto, 80-20%, like your five days on, one day off, one day fast type of thing. So important thing to look at. And then I'm going to skip through some of these slides, but what we eat is really important, but how you eat, I don't care how low carb and nutrient dense, real food you're eating. But if you're eating totally stressed out, working at your desk, chewing your food, super fast, swallowing foods and big chunks, eating like a pig, basically you are not going to digest that food properly. So it doesn't matter if you're eating great, healthy, clean food, or if you're eating crap, it's not going to break down and you're causing digestive stress. So be sure to take a pause, a timeout when you're going to eat a meal, sit and make it a moment. You're eating as if you're in Europe and they make that meal a part of their day. So stop, pause and reset. Take three deep breaths in and out. 
Relax. Once you feel yourself calm and in that parasympathetic state, that's rest and digest, then you can eat, but eat slowly. Don't rush. I have to tell myself all the time because I'll eat lunch, my lunch dinner during the work week, two thirty, three o'clock, and then I need to get back to work. So we eat too fast and don't chew our food. So we're always reminding ourselves, slow down. So personalized nutrition program, how to eat. This is what I would look at. I work on people looking, ideally, not everyone does their genetics, but I like what I just do. My DNA, there's DNA fit, DNA company. There's lots of options, strategy, looking at ancestry background, working on your stress levels. Because again, if your cortisol, melatonin, circadian rhythm is off, you're, you're going to be out of whack, stress response, glucose response. We need to address. So your lifestyle habits, your exercise, your sleep, and then measurements as I said, respiratory, our Q value is something you measure at rest, Pinoe testing kit, or at exercising during treadmill or bike test, ketone monitor as Keto Mojo, or which is blood test, or the new one, BioSense coming out, and then continuous glucose monitor. I like CGMs uh, are super easy. That NutriSense is great. There's also levels, right? Levels. And then there's Keto Mojo test as well. So what I also look at people, metabolic typing diet check record chart. So we look at this. How do you feel when you eat your appetite, satiety, cravings, your energy levels, mind, emotion, well-being. So I give people this chart. Think about this when you're eating. Here's the ideal. Here's not so great. How do you feel? Most people don't have a clue how they feel after they eat. So we want to pay attention to that. Next, nutrigenomics, looking at insights from DNA Fit or your DNA company. There's great information, my DNA. I would like to do a recording of my results that they sent me. It's pretty interesting. Fueling the low carb athlete, we want to make sure we're getting this chart from Brad Kearns made carnivore scores, food ranking chart. This is nutrient dense food. Now, it's not all carnivore, but it's just here's the most nutrient dense food. And that's why people choose more of a carnivore, keto carnivore diet. But again, it's eat real nutrient dense foods. So avocados, dark chocolates on here, fermented foods, fruit, honey, nuts, nut butters, properly prepared vegetables, seaweed, sweet potatoes, squash, and then optional, extremely high nutrient value is on here as well. That could cause small chance of digest irritation. Some foods might cause some issues, but again, if you listen to what we do with Ben Greenfield is properly prepare those foods that you might eat in there as grains. Okay. Dr. Gabrielle Leon. I love following what she says and listening to her because she's awesome. 20 to 40, even though she says some of the 30 to 50 grams now, every three to four hours, small advantage of muscle protein since the, since the cyst. Can I ever say that word? Muscle recovery and growth. Muscle is an organ of longevity. That is my backside when I was in Lava Man in April. I like to lift weights and I lift heavier weights because it's more fun. Five, six reps. Great. So how do you get stronger? How do you eat your protein? How much protein do you have a day? I mean, so you want to get as Dr. Leon's formula, I think is easiest because it's in pounds, but different formula, 0.55 to 0.8, up to one gram of protein per pound of lean body mass. And then there's Dr. Gabriel Leon says one, whatever your goal, ideal body weight is, that's how much protein in grams you want a day. So if you want to weigh 130 pounds, that's how much protein you should have a day. Females, same thing. Your same formula. And you have to make sure start with at least getting a hundred grams because most females are not eating enough. We're dieting too much and eating too little. People don't get that a plate <laughs> of protein, 20 to 40, 50 grams is a lot. And yes, you eat that much because it makes you feel full and you don't want to eat again for hours. It takes away those cravings. So make sure you sit and eat your food, proper digestion, because most people you eat all this, but eat too fast. You're going to have that food 
like piece of steak sitting in your organ, your stomach a long time. <laughs> so make sure you take digestive enzymes, HCL, have apple cider vinegar, shot help that digestion. You have slow motility like I do. So Gabrielle Leon's protein intake is about 30%, a minimum of 30 grams three times a day, up to 30% fat and about 40 grams of carbs. Tweak as necessary. This is not for the athlete. This is the general person. So starchy carbs in small amounts, each meal, four to six ounces of protein or 30, 40 grams, grass-fed beef, organic poultry, protein shakes work well. If you need something quick and easy, I've been doing that, but doing two scoops of protein, adding some frozen avocado, adding MCT oil and mixing it with ice and water. Sometimes some mushrooms and maca on ashwagandha, some glutamine, colostrum. I kind of throw it all in there. Also, um, Gabrielle Leon's protocol is use oil, apple cider vinegar and vegetables. I love out olive oil, sesame oil, and apple cider vinegar mixed together with sea salt and put it on the cabbage that you can get like a Trader Joe's as organic cabbage, by the way. Side note, that's a great dressing. You just throw it together and everyone loves it. And I say, all it is apple cider vinegar, olive oil, and sesame oil, add that sea salt and you're good to go. All right. So what to look at? We want to look at Mixing up your eating plan. Dr. Anna Quebec has her great new book, Menu Pause. It's not just for females, but men as well. But there's six day food plan variations. So maybe you do carnivore for six days, or maybe you do it a month, but then switch it up. And maybe you do a AIP program where you eliminate eggs and dairy. And what else is there? You soy, corn, all the inflammatory foods. Track your ketones, track your sleep, your heart rate variability, aura, whoop. There's a new heart rate variability coming out test with, um, oh my gosh, Dr. J. Wiles. It's Hanu, but Hanu, Hanu, because they say it. I always think of Han- Hanu, but that's a turtle. Hanu is means something else in Hawaiian. Improved digestion. Again, most people I need to get to suggest enzymes. I like bio-optimizers, mass enzymes in their HCL, working on probiotic. So all these tips here you can find on the ebook. Again, nutrition hacks, apple cider vinegar. I just like ketones from HVMN. I have that in the day when I'm working. Uh, K-Pax from bio-optimizers, really good for fat digestion. It also helps keep you full, have it early in the day. Essential oils, bone broth, all those are... Great things. So it's good tips there. And then ketones. If you go to HVMN, ketone IQ, you can save money with our code low carb athlete. And this is something great when you are doing the fat adapted processes in in your program. We do a cold keto phase for a week, two weeks, or one week at a time, and then spread it out for the female cycle. But this is where you can throw in a shot of 10 milliliters of ketones. Intuitive fueling and training is something I talk about. And as an athlete, I think we have to learn how to know when to break or fast, know when to eat before a workout, when to eat during a workout, because it's easy. I can go not eat at all in a workout and feel fine on LMNT or real light in my water and wait till I get home and have a shake and then wait till I'm hungry to eat a solid meal. Now, sometimes you could, as S Fuel's slogan is go longer if I added some fuel. Now their go longer train drink mix barely has any calories, but it has some MCT from coconut and it has glutamine to help your gut health and electrolytes. So that is an option. I've also used Vespa before long runs, F-bombs. I used to use, they're coming back out. Uh, The founders are actually taking back their company. They sold it. Now they're taking it back and starting over. So you'll see more F-bombs around. Those are great ones to throw nut butter with MCT oil. Um, also Vinnie Tortich has a company, their ultra fat bombs are really good. They're fat and some electrolytes in there. I think, uh, Keon aminos, of course I use before, during, and after I've been doing more of the capsules cause I am not doing well with anything with, um, stevia. So I've been trying to cut that out. And then protein post-workout leucine is you don't want it by itself. You want it essential amino acids, the leucine that's in whey protein, 
you want to get. And there's also goat whey protein. And then there's second runner up. If you can't do whey is by equip. They have, if you go to my website, sponsors for the podcast page, leucine is a high amount in bone or sorry, beef broth or beef protein and equip brand as a new shake mix has unsweetened beef protein. If you don't want the vanilla or chocolate, but they have unsweetened that you could just add to a shake, which I prefer because then I can add a spoonful of sunflower, nut butter, almond butter, bone broth. You can get with MCT oil, um, for powder, or you can buy, I like bonafide provisions. Freezer section is my favorite bone broth in the winter time. Add some MC toil or butter to make that more of a recovery drink or something when I'm kind of hungry, but don't want solid food. So we want to match our training and fueling. But then there's people that aren't eating before exercise. So let's talk about this and we'll probably wrap it up because this is a long topic. So here's some training, fasted training research. Fasted training, low glycogen training can enhance fat oxidization and training adaptation. Training without carbohydrates can increase fat oxidization. But be aware, warning signs when you need to add more calories if you have excessive weight loss, your heart rate variability is dropping, your sleep quality is going down the drain and your glucose levels are off. Now this is research from Dan Plew's program Endure. I just want to share their summary on fasted training research. So female athletes, which is a whole other podcast I need to record. Female athletes are different than male athletes. Duh. And we should only do fasted training late follicular to ovulation. So say that's day, let's see, day eight to day 14. So if ovulation is around day 14, 15, if you're on a set schedule, if you're not perimenopausal, you have a consistent cycle. You might make sure your fasted training is during certain times of the month. And we'll go over that in my fasted chart. You'll see a 20 minute video I just recorded on my map that I made. And You can find that on the low carb athlete YouTube channel. So carb timing is important for the lowest carb meal. Dan Plews has earlier start of the day and post training is the largest carb intake. So this is more Ironman athletes and that are competing like Dan's doing racing and doing a lot of low heart rate, say the 80, 20, 20% high heart rate. And you have to time where those workout windows are, where you're going to be able to eat food and having your largest carb intake probably like for me, mid afternoon after I swim and then I'll eat lunch, dinner around today was three o'clock and I made a shake after swimming. And that's where I can place my carbs and not see a spike in my glucose. Now post carb workout intake after high intensity work can be beneficial. So if I did Like tomorrow morning, I'm running probably at 6 a.m. doing a 45 minute workout with speed work intervals with high, low heart rate. And then I should have something to eat after that with maybe some carbohydrates. So Neil actually just made some little red potatoes and those are good starch to have resisted starch when they're cooled. So he cooks some secret tip here. You cook your bacon, take the bacon out and then save the bacon fat in the big tray put the little baby potatoes in there, cook those and then cool them, put them in the fridge. And then I had one with a piece of steak and mozzarella. It was really good. (laughs) So that was my carb. So are you doing too much fasted? I talk about this all the time, more personal reasons because gosh, it's been about five years. I don't know how long I've been doing fasted exercise whenever got into doing OMAD and doing too much fasted exercise. I was doing calories. So it's not purely fasted, but doing keeping a fat burning state because I was doing coffee with heavy cream. I quit doing the fat coffee, MC2 oil and butter in collagen a long time ago because I think it was just too much uh, fat. And I think it wasn't necessary to get all those calories in because people are eating like a stick of butter and forget that is a lot of calories <laughs> and sometimes it's not so much saturated fat for some of us can't tolerate that much. So I mix it up, but warning signs of doing too much fasting. I think we need to look at. So like we had in the other slide, I think it's important to review again. 
are you pushing the low energy availability too far? Dan talks about this in the NGR program. If you have poor outcome, poor consequences, again, I say more is not better. Go back to, see, I can say this both ways. This is more probably a man's perspective or problems when you're fasting too much. You're dropping weight too fast, your sleep, your HRV, your glucose, and glucose goes up because cortisol is released from excessive stress. Stress response is, remember, a glucose response. But what I'm saying from a female perspective, what if personal experience, you're doing all this and you're not losing weight, maybe you're gaining weight. (laughs) So what is the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. If I'm doing fasted workouts, I'm barely eating. I'm training two, three times a day and I'm gaining weight. Why do we keep doing what we're doing? We're so naive. We're stubborn. We need to eat often more calories. And that doesn't mean carbs. It could mean more protein and fats and then healthy sources of carbs after those harder workouts. But I think we're just doing too much. And I'm really was interested in the podcast I did with, um, Dan Feldman on his energy, you know, looking at, are you metabolizing your food, right? Are you getting energy from your food that you're eating? And are we doing too much of everything? Because I've said that for a long time, maybe in my internal voice, but are we doing too much fasted exercise? It goes back to when CrossFit started. Are we doing people doing too much HIIT training? Are they doing too much fasting now? And are they doing too strict of keto and not cycling in and out and having metabolic flexibility because they took out carbs completely for a year or two? And then there's people doing only carnivore, which I know can be healing, but what if that leads you to a poor relationship with food and you are getting more of an eating disorder? So there's so much to look at and we really need to pay attention to our intuition and unintentional fasting and paying attention to when you just need to eat something. And it doesn't need to be something crappy. It could be healthy foods that are like avocado and what I have this morning, avocado and grilled chicken and the sliced mozzarella. And we had fermented locally made sourdough bread with olive oil and sea salt. And I had avocado toast because I did two workouts so I could do it. And it was great, but it wasn't a grocery store sourdough bread. It had to be freshly made fermented. That's only good for like two days before it's rock hard. Okay. Tips for fasted workouts. If you are going to eat something, I've been using Laird's superfoods unsweetened creamer in my coffee in the morning and cinnamon. So it has some mushroom adaptogens. So that's something that's some calories. It still keeps me burning fat. If you need to include carbs and workout, well, Ben Greenfield says, if you are going to work out again within eight hours, Maybe you need carbs in that meal after your workout in the morning. If you are doing another workout in the afternoon within eight hours. Now, if you don't eat dinner an hour or two after late dinner, what was I saying here? Don't eat dinner for an hour or two after your workout. So if you work out, say like Ben says at four o'clock and then you eat dinner at 7 p.m., you should be good to go for fueling your morning workout. If you can't have supplements, it's amino acids, ketone salts, potassium electrolytes. So I like to use um, a Jigsaw Health Adrenal Cocktail. I like a key on aminos. I've been doing Element or Real Light. And the potassium is in Real Light Element T. It's potassium, magnesium, sodium, the right ratio. So Ben has an article in a great podcast that he did for Dr. Pompa on fasted exercise for athletes. So 12 to 16 hours intermittent fasting maximum for men, women, 12 hours max. So weekdays, like I ate and let's see, I stopped eating at four o'clock today and I'm usually not hungry the rest of the night. I'll just have water with some element tea in it and some aminos before bed and I'm usually not hungry, but I'm trying to be more uh, respectful, I guess, of my body. If it's hungry, maybe I should have a little something. 
if it's some chia seed pudding and have something might be better and not cause my body to be in stress mode because that's easy to happen. So pre-menopausal women could, if we're limiting our fasting to 12 hours and we want cell autophagy, well, what we would do for our clients is put a 24 hour or OMAD dinner to dinner, lunch to lunch in a weekend or a day that you are not exercising. So for example, a Monday is not my workout day. It's usually just yoga, walking and master swim workout. And ideally it's easy workout. And that's more, more my rest day. So if I skip the swim workout that day and just did say Sunday afternoon, stop eating at two o'clock and not eat till two o'clock on Monday, that's doable, right? If you're not exercising anything hard, it's just more movement and light intensity yoga, gentle yoga. I can do that once a month. Now I was doing this, I don't know, like three, four days a week before COVID when I was training clients and I just not eat till I got home at three o'clock or something. So really respect your body because my thyroid is in the tank. My estrogens like blow optimal menopausal and not even menopausal. So my hormones are messed up. And I think a lot of it has to do with, I was doing everything too much, even though my adrenal exhaustion started in 2013, I was feeling better, but then I started doing too much fasting, too much OMAD. And that's why I want to share this info with you. So you don't do that. So women can do a morning workout. That's easy fasted you can do aminos and ketones, but we don't want to do anything hard because we'll trigger the endocrine suppression regulation that we'll talk about. My other seminar here about the hormone kispeptin is impacted. So we want to save the harder workout. If you have control of when you work out later in the day, or you can eat something before you work out, even as ketones and HVMN ketones are my favorite or and or key on essential aminos, drink them or take the capsules. And that should give you a little something. Now it will still keep you burning fat. You're not going to be eating carbs. You can still keep in a fat burning state. Now, if you're going for a long bike ride, Ben Greenfield likes Fatargo. Some people like, uh, you can, I like S fuels and there's S fuels train and there's S fuels race now. But I'll, often I on my long bike rides, I've been experimenting eating before my bike ride on a Saturday, and then I'm going to go ride three hours. I'm just good having water with electrolytes, almond tea, but I'll do two scoops of real aid or one packet of almond tea. And there are little bottles of ketones that you could take on a, a longer bike ride to give you that dual fuel. But if you're not racing, I don't think it's necessary, but a bar on a ride longer that's 20 grams of protein and some fat and protein mixed into it as there's a few different ones I suggest to my clients. And then long fasted bike ride without carbs, ketone, aminos, electrolytes can be used. But I often ask people, are you impacting your performance? Yes, I can do a four hour bike ride fasted, maybe even five, but am I going to be slower I don't want to impact my performance. I want to go fast and feel strong. So I think a lot of people are just being that all or nothing that they're just not knowing when to eat. You're still going to burn fat. So it doesn't matter if you switch to carbs and back to fat. So example of Ben Greenfield, he stays in mild ketosis, one to three millimoles all day by not eating a lot of carbs. He does eat some vegetables, I think in a smoothie depending on his cycle, he's always mixing up, which we should all mix up how we eat seasonally. Doesn't eat carbs all day, then works out late in the afternoon, early evening, increases, induces temporary insulin sensitivity from the workout. Carbs, he puts at dinner. Now he's obviously super strong, lean. So more muscle you have, more storage tank you have, he can take 100 to 200 grams of carbs. And that carbohydrate helps increase serotonin and serotonin helps make melatonin. So he has enough carbs until the next time he eats dinner the next day. So he stays in insulin sensitive state post-workout evening refeed of carb. You restock your glycogen stores in your liver and muscles. 
because you can upregulate those GLUT4 transporters that shuttle the car- glucose into those muscles. So then you'll have enough fuel on board for the next day's workout. Now in the morning, if you are not dysregulated in your hormones, your cortisol should naturally be higher. So we have more and in- more insulin sensitive in the morning. So we don't want to do a hard workout and we don't need to eat right away because we already have insulin and that's going to increase our glucose in the morning. That's why we see that glucose reading a little higher. So if you can work out exercise later in the afternoon, again, improves insulin sensitivity. So you can work out and have your carbs at night. So that's Ben's example. So those are some other Q and A's from Ben's podcast two workouts a day, you know, what would you do? Maybe have a S fuels bar in between. If you're doing higher intensity, have 20 to 60 grams post-workout after your first workout, then you're ready to have the fuel for the next workout. So this is from Dan Plews. Fasting for female athletes. This is where I will do a separate show just to summarize this and I'll wrap it up. Female adaptation, a low glycogen state, more efficient at fat oxidization. So this is Dan Plews and team research. Follicular phase is follicular's day one to ovulations about day 13, 14 is easy to do through your fasted exercise. Monitor to visualize your program. Limit your fasted exercise two to three times a week, only on days 17 to 14 of your cycle. So two to three times a week, that's out of the whole month. So days seven to 14, you can do fasted exercises, the ideal days. Other than that, it's probably good to have something which can be still fat burning. Remember putting that MCT oil collagen in your coffee is causing calories and which would not be a fasted exercise. So fasted means black coffee, tea, water. High energy intake with high energy output. So variations within the energy flux with our hormone cycle. So we want to match our fueling and training. So when we have a high energy intake, when we have high energy output, so match your higher intensity exercise, we want to get the right energy nutrients in. We have low energy input and output in the luteal phase. So the end of your cycle, you kind of probably know it females that you probably feel a little sluggish before your cycle begins. So we want to limit fasted training. We want to monitor our mood. We want to check our heart rate variability and our sleep for stressors. Now I made this great chart. You have to go back and watch my 20 minute video. I did. I took information from Dr. Mindy Pels. She has a new book coming out called fasting like a girl Info from Cynthia Thurlow. I've listened to Ben Azadi and my friend, Dr. Anna Kabeca, and talked to NutriSense. And I talked, read up on Aura Ring blogs. And there is a reason if you read or watch your Aura Ring score in your luteal phase, body temperature goes up, heart rate variability goes down. My heart rate was higher. So HRV down, heart rate higher. I'm more sympathetic nervous system. So there's your body's more stressed out fight or flight state. So your mood's going to be impacted, more anxious. And our sleep might be harder because our body temperature's up. So I've been tracking all this with the aura ring and make sure you're doing that. Use the flow app, mark on training peaks. I'm creating a training peaks program. People can buy and put into their own schedules to map out their hormones and map your workouts based on the day of the month. So pretty cool stuff. And my friend, Aaron Carson is supposed to help me write the strength training program that we'll do together videos. So lastly, best time to increase in fat oxidization and reduce carbs for female athletes is late follicular phase and early ovulation. So this is when, when we're doing the fat adaptation program that Dan Plews talks about the cold keto phase, we do two week blocks of cold keto phase. So we'll switch it up to during late follicular phase. So like the week after your menstrual cycle ends and to early ovulation. So we want to time that. So I keep saying last slide, but I'll finish the female part, but women are more sensitive to lack of food signaling than men. That's that's kiss peptin hormone. 
large amounts of long fasted training sessions need to be managed for female athletes. My mentor, Ben Greenfield says when lean active women overdo fasted exercise or do extremely glycogen depleted exercises, exercise sessions in a complete fasted state, especially after overnight fast, you tend to see a drop in hormone production. And I know ladies, I'm with you. This is so hard because I'm not hungry when you're fat adapted, you're in ketosis, you're not hungry. You don't have those cravings anymore. You're, you just don't want to eat. So having some calories in your coffee or tea, if you don't drink coffee can help you have a little bit in there. So like Trader Joe's has unsweetened collagen. You can add in your coffee. You can add some MCT oil, add Laird's coffee creamer. It's non-dairy with the mushroom adaptogens. So that's my secret tip. It is one of our ancestral mechanisms where nature doesn't want starved people who are hungry running from lions to make babies. We down-regulate a lot of these hormones responsible for fertility. And that's kiss peptin hormone. This is why Dr. Stacey Sims doesn't like women, female athletes doing fasted exercise. This is why you'll hear a lot of people, functional medicine say fasted exercise for athletes, female athletes is not ideal. It doesn't mean you need to go eat a bunch of processed foods, flours, and sugars. It means just add a little bit of something before you eat. So your body is not in stress mode. I do believe this is what happened to me. I don't know, before 2013, I was chronically stressed. If I, I wasn't eating enough, I'd go long time and not eat anything but some fat and probably not enough protein or carbs. I was very carb phobic for a long time. So be careful. Going back to Ben, ideal day, light exercise before breakfast, easy walk. That is what fasted exercise should be when we coach Ben Greenfield clients in our programs light exercise, nothing hard. Finish that with a shower with a cold shower, or if you can, a cold soaked tub, eat your breakfast. I like to have a shake or something first. Wait until early afternoon, early evening to have your harder workout session when your body's more primed. If you look at your chronotype chart, wait one to two hours to eat after your workout, but be done eating three hours before bedtime. That's my rule. So I go to bed early eight o'clock because I get up at 445 because I go to the gym at 5, 10 a.m. Because it takes me 20 minutes to get there. I back that up, stop eating. So I tell my clients kitchen closed at 7 p.m. No eating after that. You should be in bed by 10. So for sure, you should be done eating at seven. For me, it's four o'clock. But I'm trying to honor my body if it didn't get enough calories that day because I didn't eat enough and I worked out more, I should eat something. So that's something I'm working on myself. So that's where I'm going to stop. We'll move this phase two another time, but I'd love to hear from you. If you have any questions, comments, feedback, if you want to hear more of this, let me know. I'll record more. And I love doing what I'm doing. So I'd love your support. If you can share this podcast with your training friends, your triathlon group, your run group, cyclists, teams, that'd be awesome. It's hard to get this information out there on my own. And I need your help to share this message and get this podcast out there again, because it's been 10 years and there's, I don't know, probably a hundred thousand other podcasts literally out there. So I need your support. If you could leave me a review on iTunes, that helps us show up. If you could just give some comments, feedback on there, five-star review. Awesome. But if you want four, you can give me four, but five, it's going to be best. And if you can give me some comments, questions, I'll do another Q and a to know what you want. And if you want to do a discovery call with me, because this is what I do for a living is coach people full-time like you, you can do a discovery call. I have three packages I offer people, simple, not complicated. I've just condensed it. New client special, the accelerator program, or my VIP six month or longer inclusive package, like concierge service. So there's three levels. And then there's also often people that do the new client special, then just meet for a one hour coaching call and follow up once a month. So there are options and using training peaks and just 
looking at chronometer, I use practice better and really track all your biometrics and data and give feedback and help personalize a nutrition and exercise and lifestyle program for you. So you can be the best version of yourself today, but also training for your future self when you are 80, 90 years old, right? So I look forward to hearing from you. Thanks for watching low carb athlete on YouTube and make sure you follow me on Instagram, low carb athlete or, and Facebook. Thanks for listening to the Low Carb Athlete Podcast. If you have any questions, feedback, or topic suggestions, let us know on Facebook or at DebbiePotts.net. You can help us to continue to grow by leaving a review on iTunes. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.